we want all of us to be together in the Council. Uh, it's an opportunity, as I say, to interact NGO to NGO and to utilize the facility and uh, wonderful organization of the United Nations Association of the USA and the United Nations Foundation in advancing causes that are near and dear to each of us. Each of our organizations has a particular focus, things that are really important to us. And what we in the Council try to do is recognize and respect those and give another platform to them to be able to get the word out to other fellow NGOs and as advocates to, in the U.S., to the administration and to Congress on those issues that are really important to us. So I really do encourage the very few people who are not members of the Council here, and I don't want to embarrass you by asking you to raise your hands, but I just want you, before you leave, please do stop at the desk. Yield has this very short one-page form which I really strongly encourage you to fill out and leave with us and join us. It's also a very user-friendly uh, annual amount of support for our work, very, very reasonable. And uh, more important than, than the funds, it's the energy and the participation. We want your energy. We need your participation. We ask you to join us with both of those and be one of us. And one of the reasons why I think the Council and the UNA USA and UNF uh, are so important to the current state of the world is that those issues are really very basic, and today's program is exemplary of that. There's nothing more basic than human rights. There's nothing more tragic than what's going on in Syria today, and we all recognize that. And we're very fortunate to have an opportunity today to look at part of that picture. So I'd like to call uh, to the stage the two people who are the program today, Felice Gare and our guest of honor, Sergio Pinero, to come up and join us up here. Uh, I'd like to welcome them. Felice, you know by reading the program that she is probably the most involved, the most eminent, the most wonderful person in human rights in America today. She is the director of the Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights. She has many, many credits, only some of which are listed on her biography here. But to those of us who grew up post Eleanor Roosevelt, Felice Gare serves a very important model for us all. So Felice, would you please come up? <laughs> and Felice will both introduce and carry on the program for here. Uh, we have a really special uh, event today and a special opportunity, and that is to have an opportunity to speak with Sergio, Paulo Sergio Pinheiro, uh, who is, um, has just received, just an hour ago, uh, the 2012 Leo Nevis Human Rights Award uh, from the UNA USA, uh, which um, uh, in recognition of a lifetime of achievement in this area. He is uh, Brazilian. He, um, although he says that his, he, he he attributes his success in the UN to his uh, French language skills. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he told us that story uh, just a little earlier, uh, but he has written about the fact that the first time he was selected as a special rapporteur, it was uh, not because he was, it was because he was not European, not American, and not African, he and spoke fluent French. Uh, and therefore was uh, suitable to be special rapporteur on Burundi, a post he served in for five years until he had this terrible automobile accident and uh, from which, thank God, he has recovered uh, completely and went on to become the special uh, rapporteur on uh, Myanmar uh, for eight years uh, in the uh, uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and uh, following that, he has been a uh, special uh, rapporteur. I think actually the title was representative of the Secretary General uh, writing on violence against children, which is an extraordinary report. If you're not familiar with it, go look it up. Um, it's, it really sets the mark on, on this issue and will for a long time. And uh, Marta Santos Pius, who's the special representative, uh, working at UNICEF now on these issues, who could not be here uh, today uh, and who sends her regards, Paula, to you uh, and her congratulations, 
um, uh, is uh, carrying out this, uh, just the tip of the, uh, the mandate of uh, following up on these issues uh, dealing with violence against children. Well, since last year, uh, to skip ahead, um, uh, uh, Paula Sergio S Pinheiro has been uh, chair of the Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry on Syria. Now, what's a commission of inquiry? Some of you know that the in here in New York, the Secretary General sometimes appoints special representatives and sometimes asks for teams to go out and so forth. In the human rights program, it's a little different. The um, human rights, the commissioner, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, does have the power of initiative, but uses it very rarely and, and uh, hasn't uh, really made many such appointments. But the Commission on Human Rights, and the, which is now replaced by the Human Rights Council, uh, has sent special rapporteurs beginning in 1979. I uh, was corrected today to be reminded that the first special rapporteur was in 1979 on Chile. First thematic special rapporteur, which had a worldwide focus, was on uh, um, involuntary and enforced disappearances. It was really on Argentina, but it became a worldwide mechanism, and it opened the door to the fact that if you have uh, investigators who can go and look at a theme and travel to a country and receive complaints about situations in those countries, they can actually uh, have a worldwide mandate and report and and uh, go to countries as well and really um, uh, maintain uh, continuing surveillance and um, uh, scrutiny uh, and try to correct the situations. Well, a commission of inquiry is bigger than a special rapporteur, which is what the Human Rights Council uh, has uh, 47 special rapporteurs or working groups or special independent experts or whatever they call them um, uh, on all of the rights in the Universal Declaration and a dozen country-specific uh, special mechanisms. And uh, a commission of inquiry is a relatively new matter uh, which involves not just uh, one individual but but usually a team of, um, well, they've been two, three, four uh, on these commissions of inquiry. And um, uh, some of them have a more juridical uh, approach, uh, but it's this, the idea has been that they're to go and to examine s the situation in the country and to report back according to whatever the mandate, the specific mandate, applied is. There have been studies, there's even been a conference on what are commissions of inquiry and how do they differ from uh, these other mechanisms. The important thing is they are traveling uh, to meet with victims, they are on the phone to talk with victims, they are in the outlying areas where people can come uh, and uh, they've talked to over a thousand, they've had over a thousand interviews with uh, victims. Uh, uh, people who have uh, fled Syria or who have suffered in some way uh, during the uh, uh, current crisis. Uh, in addition to that, they have been mandated to come back to the council and to report on their findings. Uh, there is um, uh, there was a visit last June by the Commission of Inquiry, by the chair of the Commission of Inquiry, to Damascus. June 25th or thereabouts, uh, and uh, and uh, that also allowed the conversations with the government and um, on on a number of uh, specific issues. All of these are described in the reports. Now you have an excerpt from uh, the most recent one on the table here. If you're if you're interested, what you have the opportunity to do today is to meet with, talk with uh, Paulo Pinheiro. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we're absolutely delighted that Commissioner Karen Abu Zaid, uh, the other member of the commission, uh, until now, there's now been two new people added, but, uh, uh, but Karen's been there since the beginning, 
um, uh, is here as well, and I hope that you might be willing to answer or chime in on a few questions uh, as we go along. So, uh, Brazil, uh, by the way, when he was in Brazil, he did a few other things. He, he's not only a professor, and he not only has uh, um, established a center uh, for the study of violence, uh, but he served as uh, the uh, Minister for Human Rights um, uh, in the, uh, mm, I would say, what was it, about 10 years ago? Uh, about 10 years ago uh, in the government, a post uh, in which he says the other people in the government hated him because he, talk, he spoke the truth. Um, well, uh, that's what uh, uh, human rights is supposed to be about, and I described it a little bit earlier this afternoon as speaking the truth, not half-truths, to power. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Paulo Pinheiro, and we'll have a conversation about Syria. I thought uh, perhaps we could ask um, uh, Mr. Pinheiro to say a few words first about the commission, and then uh, open, uh, open it to questions. I have a lot of questions, but I wanted to give you an opportunity just to share with uh, uh, all of our guests uh, your views of how the, how the commission is doing and, and how are your findings uh, turning out? Uh, is, there any, uh, is there anything we need to know uh, that um, uh, that you can uh, update us on. Okay, uh, uh, thanks to your request, I do accept it. Uh, thank you uh, to the state for the introduction. Uh, I, I appreciate that uh, the previous speaker, Aaron, also mentioned that uh, everything that I, s I will say here is part of the, the picture. As, uh, that is, uh, we have not access uh, to Syria, then we have uh, this, uh, this limitation. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, our um, uh, commission has another eccentricity uh, that is uh, a commission on ongoing conflict. Because most of the commissions of, of inquiry appointed by uh, the Security Council, or by the former Commission on Human Rights, or this uh, this council, they are about ex post. That is, they they began to do the investigation after uh, the conflict is terminated, and this uh, puts enormous uh, problems for for our task because uh, uh, it's like an uh, evolving kaleidoscope. Every morning we have uh, a new thing happening and uh, we have to position ourselves more or less almost every day, even if we don't uh, speak every day happily. Um, uh, the, uh, the commission, uh, the basically objective of the, the commission is to, uh, to report, to, to document, um, human rights violations. And uh, after June, July also breaches to international humanitarian law because the International Committee of the Red Cross has recognized the, the conflict as a non-international armed conflict or what means in common language, uh, civil war. Then we are having a civil war in all the territory. You know. And uh, there is a uh, there is a, a very uh, serious uh, escalation. As the, uh, the special rapporteurs, we prepare uh, reports, uh, but the report is only part of our, our work uh, because uh, in a similar way to the work of the special rapporteur, we have uh, a sort of, um, let's say, a diplomatic uh, role in terms of uh, uh, engaging with uh, the states, not only the, the government of, of uh, the Syrian Arab Republic, but also with uh, uh, the countries um, of the region, the neighboring countries of Syria, but also other countries uh, that have uh, influence uh, in the conflict. Uh, Principally, the, the five uh, members of uh, the, the Security Council, other Security Council uh, members, uh, and then uh, we, uh, every time that we are 
in New York or Geneva, and also we go to the capitals to meet uh, the, uh, the governments of uh, the, d uh, the foreign affairs, uh, the departments of state of those, uh, those countries. Uh, we try to, uh, to keep uh, those states uh, informed uh, about what we do. Uh, as was saying this morning, with states, they don't like uh, they don't appreciate to be surprised by sudden uh, moves by special protea or by the commissions that uh, that the all our moves uh, we we share uh, with uh, uh, with the government. That is, uh, I, I think this is uh, this is a very tiresome exercise, uh, but uh, I think that is uh, very important. Uh, Comparing with the special protests, we are able to have a team. Uh, now, we, until now, we are sort of 20 uh, people, investigators, military advisors, legal advisors. Uh, and as I said, the coordinator of the team is there besides uh, Karen Abuzid, that Sula uh, Sedev, that has an enormous experience. Uh, and then I, uh, this, the mandates of the special protests uh, they are able to get um, much better assistance than the special protests that sometimes have one or two uh, uh, assistance from the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, sometimes we have some secondments or some other agencies uh, in, inside, the, uh, inside the UN. Uh, we hope that uh, in this uh, new extension of the mandate, we will uh, be, uh, we'll have our investigative uh, uh, capacity uh, uh, strengthened, uh, and then we present. We have how many? How many uh, reports we have presented until now? Four, four reports. Uh, four reports. The last one on 17 September, and uh, I think that uh, concerning the the commission, I think that is. But I can answer any question about the commission. Uh, pe perhaps I could. Uh, after uh, uh, some questions, I could give some highlights of about the present situation. I don't know. No. Uh, then I, I, I would, I would just. Uh, it's a sort of up, up to date uh, of the, the report that uh, you have. Uh, it's a, it's a big report of 120 pages, but uh, I think that you have uh, printed the 25 first pages. That is the, the center of the. Uh, the report. Um, we have to have in mind that the violations of human rights and uh, and breaches of humanitarian law have escalated dramatically uh, after 90 months of uh, of conflict. Uh, in the when we are beginning to work, uh, uh, those violations were concentrated in some areas of the uh, the country and uh, it was not uh, a full-fledged armed conflict this was a, a gradual uh, escalation I, I think that we have missed many opportunities to solve the uh, the crisis uh, uh, we cannot only lament we, we don't waste too much time lamenting because this is a, a waste of uh, energy but uh, looking Backwards, uh, Karen and I, we think that uh, several opportunities were lost, not by ourselves, but uh, uh, the main actors of this uh, uh, crisis in the international uh, uh, community. Uh, as I said this morning, there are no innocents uh, in this conflict. Uh, it's, it's not a, a conflict uh, between the the good force and uh, the force of uh, evil, or the bad forces. Uh, uh, both sides uh, are committing uh, uh, human rights uh, and uh, 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 breaches of humanitarian law. And uh, we were, I think that we were the first ones to, to call attention for that. Of course, there is a dramatic uh, gap between what the government forces perpetrate and, of course, what the armed uh, groups and the, the Free Syrian Army uh, practice. But I, I think it's our duty to, we cannot close the eyes because it's a fight against an authoritarian regime. 
the rules of engagement are to be respected. And, uh, and if we are so much worried about accountability, accountability is not something just for the future, accountability is now. And uh, we expect that, that both sides could deal with those violations, something that is not uh, happening uh, at all. Uh, we have seen uh, indiscriminate uh, attacks, bombardment on on uh, civilian uh, residential neighborhoods. That is uh, something very dramatic. Uh, not only because of uh, the strategy of the government to, to use uh, uh, bombardment, uh, aviation, uh, uh, heavy uh, uh, weapons, uh, but also because uh, the armed groups um, operate inside uh, uh, residential areas and now they have developed a sort of guerrilla movement uh, war that uh, when the government bombards uh, some area, they don't try to keep the area, but they go to another uh, village or another residential area, and then this expands uh, the conflict for all the, uh, the territory. Uh, we, in the report, we mentioned several incidents of uh, uh, very heavy sh shelling, uh, by uh, by the uh, by the government, um, as the BBC says uh, this morning, uh, we said this in a press conference. Uh, something that worries us very much is the presence of uh, what we we are, we are calling uh, foreign uh, Islamic uh, radical Islamic militant uh, jihadists or Salafists. Uh, uh, that are of, uh, an opportunistic presence uh, in the conflict because they are not uh, fighting for, uh, they are not fighting against the authoritarian regime or for democracy or for ru the rule of law. They don't care <laughs> uh, for the rule of law, for humanitarian law. Uh, they, are, they are fighting for their own agendas, the caliphate, uh, uh, the integration of uh, pol politics uh, and, uh, and religion, and uh, they, uh, uh, they increase uh, the radicalization of the methods of uh, warfare. They are very good, uh, uh, they have uh, good skills in terms of explosives. Uh, several of the main explosives, uh, the, uh, the armored groups or the Syrian Free Army has, have not the skill to do that. Uh, we, we think that this is the contribution of uh, those groups. Uh, that have no problems also in terms of material resources. Uh, there are other people outside financing uh, this, uh, these groups. And in fact, uh, they are fighting also against the heretics, the Alawites, uh, the heretics of the, the Shia. Uh, then is a, is a, is a, is a, is a religious uh, uh, war also against the heretics that they consider heretics uh, uh, or the the full Shia or the, the Sunni. Uh, we are able to, to make um, a significant uh, body of uh, evidence. We have, uh, in one year, we did 1,100 interviews. It's not easy to do that. It's not a, a kind of to make a, a survey in New York. You go to find with some people, you ask what they think about the, the sofa or the Coca-Cola or something. And, but uh, you are dealing with wounded people, families, not only militants or uh, members of the armed group, but you are dealing uh, with people escaping the war or escaping the terrible condition of life. Uh, there, are, there is a calculation that around uh, 2,500,000 people are internally uh, are, are in need of the basic uh, uh, thing, uh, water, access to electricity, food, and they, they, they try to live uh, to leave the country. Uh, some people um, are not very happy because we don't publish names. Uh, and then we explain that uh, uh, our standard of proof is, is, is very low. It's not uh, the same as a tribunal, international tribunal, or the, uh, the ICC. Uh, what we did, we have uh, established two sets of lists of names and units where uh, gross human rights violations have been committed and we deposit uh, with the office of the High Commissioner. The High Commissioner herself has not read, she 
nobody knows this list because they are in a, in a sort of James Bond uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, it's a kind of bag with two, two locks and only two people together can open. One day uh, for uh, a competent international uh, judicial body and, and I think that is our uh, duty uh, to do that. Uh, finally, uh, uh, I will say something that Kofi Annan uh, at the same time at us when he was the special envoy of the UN and the Arab League, that there is no military solution for this crisis. Uh, the army groups and the Free Syrian Army, they will not prevail and the government will not be able to return to the situation uh, 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 before uh, the war. Then, if there is no military solution, uh, of course, you have to negotiate. And uh, the other track of, uh, of this uh, dealing with this crisis, that is the new envoy, uh, like Da Brahimi, that is, is, you know him, is tremendously, is a great experience as a, a negotiator and a peacemaker. Uh, I think he's doing the correct thing. He's trying to, to engage with uh, all the countries that have influence uh, on the two parties. Uh, so that uh, uh, you can create uh, an atmosphere conducive to, to talks. Voila. Well, this is, this is a, a very grim overview. Um, and uh, one of the questions I suppose that we have right off the bat is while you continue to do this work, and the conflict continues, what uh, can the international community do to support your work? You're getting uh, a lot of, uh, you're getting more resources than an ordinary special rapporteur, but you're just a handful of people who are trying to document the violations at this point. What else could be done to support your, your work? Uh, th yes, uh, sometimes this is uh, very worrisome that we are the only body inside the, uh, inside the, the UN dealing, uh, doing this job. Because uh, Mr. Brahimi has not a uh, uh, mandate to investigate, uh, he's not a human rights investigator, so human rights is an element of uh, his mission. Uh, I, I must say that we, the our basic, new, uh, uh, staff, uh, we have uh, around 20 people, but, but in fact we have many, many more people around the, the world and in Syria because basically all the UN uh, agencies uh, that are present in uh, Syria uh, cooperate with us. Without them, uh, this work will be, uh, will be impossible. That is, inside the UN we have uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of support. Uh, what can be done, that is, I, I think the states uh, are doing what we expect, that is, the, uh, for the commission, they are give financial support to our work, that is, it's very expensive, um, e even if we, we, as you know, even if we don't receive any salary, but uh, uh, all the staff uh, uh, need uh, to have salaries and uh, they work full time, they are not uh, pro bono, um, uh, they are not contributing pro bono uh, to, uh, to this work. Uh, of course, we are not alone on that. Uh, there are very important other, as you know, other international human rights organizations. Uh, I will just uh, mention three of them, uh, uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and the, uh, the Fédération de, de Ligue des Droits de l'Homme in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but there are many other uh, NGOs uh, that are trying to impose transparency uh, about uh, the conflict uh, in, uh, in Syria. I think the media um, does also a, a, a fantastic job, even if uh, some uh, there is also a communication war. That's not everything that you see in YouTube uh, corresponds to reality. Sometimes the reality is worse, but sometimes not exactly what uh, uh, you see in YouTube. I'm not implying that uh, everything that you see in YouTube is not the truth, but uh, I must say also that we don't use any uh, information 
only those that uh, our investigators uh, collect. Of course, we read all the reports that are prepared by other NGOs, but we don't use uh, this information. This is one limitation, but I think this is very important for the future so that our evidence uh, uh, can be impartial, objective, and uh, capable of being uh, used by uh, international uh, criminal investigation. Let's take an issue like torture. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a conflict or if it's not a conflict. Um, the uh, Human Rights Watch said there were, what, 26 torture centers that they, that they identified in their report. Um, you have extensive sections in, in your uh, findings about this. Um, what do you feel, if anything, can be done to, um, uh, to stop this and to um, punish those responsible while the conflict is, is going on? Uh, I, I think that is, is very important to bear in mind, and I quote to myself because I like this paragraph. Uh, 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 figuring out what means a civil war. It's not just a military conflict. Huh? Uh, uh, s uh, we think that civil wars are, are beyond the simple confrontations between opposing segments of society. It's not something that you see in the movies. No? You have uh, uh, different armies fighting each other. Uh, but uh, what is is very dramatic import dramatically important in this conflict is that uh, the uh, civil wars are the very absence of law and order. Uh, civil wars uh, legalize the use of brute force and enforce the will of the strongest. And uh, they uh, banalize murder uh, reprisals, retaliation, torture, and, and rape. Then uh, torture is uh, a practice that is somewhat banalized, legalized uh, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the conflict. What can be done? Uh, that is, of course, we, uh, we think that the government of uh, uh, Syria th uh, that has ratified the Convention of Torture, you know this better than I, uh, they are supposed to to combat uh, this uh, practice, but uh, as far as you know, we know, we don't know a single case of uh, prosecution of uh, s uh, people uh, of tortures. And uh, the same case on the cases of torture uh, that we have reported by the armed uh, uh, opposition. Uh, the uh, we have we s uh, s we are very happy that the. Uh, the Free Syrian Army established a code of conduct, uh, and uh, we hope that uh, this can have some consequence in terms of uh, uh, no, not tolerating this kind of practice. And uh, the the other approach is is a c uh, future accountability. Uh, I think that's very important that we have good cases and. Uh, uh, the data bank that we have in the office, the confidential data bank, data bank that we have in the office, has hundreds of cases of uh, torture, well uh, documented, uh, cases that we're able to corroborate. That we just, it's not sufficient that just one testimony mentions that, but we need to verify, and we have uh, an important uh, body of uh, uh, proof uh, concerning uh, uh, torture. Of course, the special rapporteur on, on torture can also be uh, active on that, the, the committee also. Uh, but uh, uh, in the middle of the civil war, I don't have great hopes that torture will stop, be stopped. One of the things that was uh, uh, noticed uh, before the, con the crisis began uh, by the Committee Against Torture was precisely the fact that no security official has any juridical responsibility for any action taken in his official capacity. They are exempt from uh, any criminal responsibility for actions taken in the course of carrying out their official duties. So of course, with that kind of official impunity, anything goes, and this was something that uh, we identified before the crisis as
something that in fact encourages abuse, doesn't discourage it. Whether in the course of a conflict, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, the president said that uh, he was ending the state of emergency and there was hopes that maybe some of these things could be changed by law. Uh, well, it, it, reading your reports and hearing what you have to say now, uh, this is not, uh, not very uh, likely uh, that there's going to be this kind of change. So uh, I wanted to press that issue precisely because one hopes maybe somewhere there are some levers that can be used in, in the course of the crisis. Um, and I appreciate your point that it's, it's almost impossible. Another thing is the whole question of prevention. You spoke about the fact that, uh, that uh, at least for some of the foreign fighters that have come into the country, uh, they're, they're involved in the religious war and uh, against the Alawites. And uh, one of the fears uh, that has been expressed, particularly, for example, by the Christian community in uh, Syria, is that um, they and the Alawites and other minorities will be um, the subject of uh, ethnic cleansing, if not genocide. Uh, they look to what happened in Iraq uh, with the minorities and the um, and and uh, and many of the many of the Christians who are in uh, Syria, in fact, fled from uh, Iraq. Uh, but uh, so in that kind of a situation, are there preventive steps that can be taken now, do you think, as a result of your findings that you can advise the um, other UN agencies that are there, the Security Council or anyone else that could be taken that could prevent uh, a, uh, uh, such a uh, horrific outcome uh, regarding those minorities? Uh. is very important that uh, UN agencies are there, uh, uh, particularly in terms of uh, humanitarian relief for uh, the victims inside uh, the country. Uh, but uh, something that we uh, mention in the report is the, is the dramatic uh, rise, as you said, in uh, sectarian uh, tensions. Because uh, uh, Syria, in terms of religion or ethnicity, it was a kind of patchwork that uh, you don't have specific territories. The Alawites were living with the Christians and uh, the Sunnis and without um, the Druze uh, and, um, reasonably well under the protection of the authoritarian state for the last almost 50 years. Uh, uh, but now, in our interviews, we are seeing even children uh, referring to other children by their ethnicity or religion. And then this is really uh, 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 the disaster. Uh, and of course, as you said, the, the Christians are in panic. And they see what happening in Iraq. And uh, if I was a Syrian with a Brazilian passport, there are 3,000. I would try to, to go to Brazil immediately because uh, uh, we don't need to have a crystal ball if uh, this will, uh, that is what you are seeing today, will be aggravated. Uh, it will be very difficult for the, the minorities to, uh, to survive. Uh, uh, that is, even if uh, uh, I don't want to mean, uh, I don't want to imply a state of panic, uh, because happily this is not uh, yet involving all the, the territory. The Christians are there, the other minorities are. But you begin uh, to see um, kidnappings of Alawites uh, and uh, attacks on Sunni. Uh, and uh, we, uh, this, uh, we perceive the situation as so serious that we uh, include in the report. Because in the other reports, we are very cautious uh, uh, about that. Because uh, the situation is so alarming that we don't want to to be uh, more alarming that, uh, the re than reality. Well, I wonder if uh, you could um, uh, tell us if you think that, uh, that there is any um, uh, any, any, any role at this point for the rest of the uh, 
UN's human rights bodies. They want you to report back. What will they do next? They've just extended the Commission on Human Rights, the uh, Commission on Inquiry. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what, where, what more can be done, uh, or is this really that you are documenting information um, for, for, for the future? when the crisis has, has ended. It, uh, it one of the things that's always said about uh, rapporteurs and about uh, commissions is that it's early warning. Well, it, you came in when there was already a crisis, not early warning. Uh, so uh, the, the question then becomes, is this, um, uh, is there a um, uh, relationship that you ha can have with with other forms of uh, UN involvement or or, or um, uh, the responsibility to protect uh, turning into the um, uh, actual intervention. I think. Uh, uh, you know perfectly well that we are very cautious about responsibility to protect. Uh, that is. Uh, uh, then we uh, have never evoked that because uh, uh, until now uh, we think that if a responsibility to protect involves a military intervention, we think that the military intervention will be a disaster. There is, we are telling this to the our interlocutors in, in the uh, opposition uh, in Syria. We tell to everybody that. Uh, uh, it's uh, Syria is not Libya. Uh, there is uh, the uh, military intervention will be a, a full. It will be increased the, the the disaster that is is there. I, I think you know very well the the, uh, the history of the Commission on, on uh, and of the Human Rights Council. I think the, the Human Rights Council ha has done everything they can. When you have a, a majority of forty members uh, supporting the resolution, what? What you want more, and uh, they are the resolutions. They are doing the the right appeals. They are characterizing the the crisis that is. Um, um, they are giving a very realistic uh, description of the of the crisis. They have appointed the commission. They have extended our mandate, and uh, I think that the the Human Rights Council is doing what uh, it is supposed to do. The problem that the game is not in the Human Rights Council. The game is in the Security Council. Uh, uh, the, uh, why? Because the uh, is a non international for the humanitarian law is a non international armed conflict. But in fact, is a, a conflict very internationalized because of the division of supports of uh, uh, both sides. I, I, I will not speak about the names of the states, but uh, it's. Uh, you just read the uh, New York Times and today and you see who supports whom. Uh, and then uh, um, um, our uh, perception, but Karin, when I invite her to say something about the humanitarian crisis, uh, I think she agrees with me that the two parties will not reach uh, uh, an understanding. Uh, uh, they have denounced Kofi Annan immediately. The very day that Kofi Annan was appointed uh, both sides were denounced, uh, not so much the government, but the uh, armed groups were denouncing Kofi uh, Annan uh, because they uh, they thought that would give some some uh, time to the government to continue killing and uh, bombarding, etc. And also, like the Brahimi, the mission of Brahimi was very much criticized by many sectors. Then, the government thinks that they can go forever, killing, uh, torturing, bombarding the population. And the armed forces, uh, the the armed groups, and the Syrian, uh, the Free Syrian Army, uh, uh, expects that they will prevail. Uh, uh, we think that this will not be the case because the diversity of uh, capability is so great that this is impossible, and uh, we cannot go on for more ninety months on that. Uh, then uh, the uh, the path uh, for that is that the five permanent members must uh, cooperate. This is very difficult at this very moment as we, our, uh, we, our 
we see in our meeting with uh, briefing with the Security Council, the situation is very much tense. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that there is no solution. Uh, always, you will no, in human rights, you will never despair. Uh, you have hope. And I think that Brahimi is doing what is, is necessary uh, to uh, be in contact with all, without any exclusion, all the, the parties, all the states that have a role uh, in the crisis. And then I think that this can help the Security Council uh, to uh, work, to be able to become operational again. Because now there is a deadlock. Uh, there is a deadlock. Uh, then I think that uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, perhaps you know the, I like so much the, an anecdote by Sergio Vieira de Mello, my friend, uh, fellow, uh, that uh, uh, you, know, you remember that in the Commission of Human Rights, the discussion about politicization of the countries in the South, they like very much to say that the, the Western groups were always politicizing the debate. And Sergio, who has a, had an enormous sense of humor, uh, said, this is very funny because this is like uh, some fish accusing the other fish of being wet. <laughs> Everything is political in this commission on human rights. No? Where you have human rights, you have the state. We have the state, you have politics. Uh, then uh, it's, uh, it's angelical to think that uh, you can uh, empty uh, human rights of this uh, political element. I think that now the solution is, is diplomatic, is political. We'll continue to do our job because uh, we have uh, uh, this mandate. Uh, I of, of course, the Council can support us. The Office of the High Commissioner can strengthen our, our uh, work. Uh, but I... I don't see that the, the solution is in the Human Rights Council. The solution is in the, the Security Council. And the Security Council, by the way, is the only that has competence to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court. Because as you know, Syria is not part of the convention. Uh, then, and the we very, that is even if it was very, it was impolite to remind the Security Council that the competence is their competence, but we have delicately reminded them that you are supposed to do that, not us. We don't have any competence to refer the crisis to the ICC, even if some people expect us to do that. Well, this is a grim situation. <laughs> don't uh, despair, don't despair. But uh, you're in communication, and, and again, if one looks for a, a bright spot there, the bright spot is actually brief the members of the Security Council? Yeah, to, uh, like you do if you're a congressman, to write to them, to say stop bickering, stop fighting, uh, you have to... No, you've done more than that. That would have been if you sent your report. You sent a report to the Security Council is like writing your congressman. But you've talked to them, you've been invited in, you've briefed them, and so the, the interaction is greater. Whether there will be action at but the end of this is another, is another matter. Um, I've promised uh, everyone here that we'll open the floor to questions. We have a little bit of time, uh, uh, and we have a microphone. So when you, when you ask your question, please identify yourself, and then make sure your question's a question. Uh, and, um, uh, and I'll uh, try to, try to uh, keep uh, this moving. Uh, as uh, you ask you, if you allow me uh, for some questions, I. I will invite Karen to come on board because it's, the honor it's, it's, a, uh, it's a privilege like that she's here with us. Yes, you know, it's very special. So, well, we have the microphone, so we'll, we'll go three ways. Um, so, uh, for the first question. Uh, Lucy Webster from uh, the World Federalist Movement. Um, what, in addition to or other than uh, referring Syria actions to the ICC, could the Security Council possibly do, in your opinion? Uh, I prefer to answer very quick. Yeah, of course, uh, this, uh, the, the Security Council has have been tried by uh, several um, permanent members, a resolution. For instance, uh, a resolution asking uh, 
asking Syria, for instance, to, to allow us uh, uh, to enter. Uh, the that is uh, the this uh, uh, it can uh, it was uh, uh, some uh, permanent members tried to use chapter seven some aspects of the chapter seven not the military intervention there are some uh, some uh, grades of intervention through chapter seven yes a, a resolution that is the body that has the power no? the he man of the international community is the Security Council yeah. but. Uh, uh I, I think that Brahimi will uh, will do this this magic. Uh, I, I I think that Kofi Annan tried everything he can. Uh, he's wonderful, and uh, uh, I, I f but uh, uh, he said uh, we were uh, I think in the same uh, longueur d'onde, in the same uh, wavelength. And but uh, uh, he uh, he thought that, that uh, the limits of what he can what he could done, etc. But uh, I think that uh, uh, Brahim now, he just arrived, he ha has more patience, and I think that he, uh, he will do that. Why should Brahimi have any success where Annan couldn't? Uh, that, uh, that is, not uh, because Brahim is better than Kofi, uh, I, I will not say that. Uh, but uh, 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 perhaps uh, he's, uh, even if now he says that he has a plan, uh, he uh, began uh, out of the constraints of a plan. Because you have the sixth point, and then you have the uh, the Geneva Agreement on um, 30th June, uh, and I, I think also that uh, Brahimi didn't raise these expectations, and then uh, I think the he g he got some time uh, since his appointment to to engage the different interlocutor. That is, there is no guarantee that he will succeed, but uh, I think that uh, it's I and also is a, is another phase of the conflict. Is the now uh, the phase is much more serious than uh, the previous one when Kofi Annan was operating, and perhaps uh, the sense of emergency of urgency will prevail. Good. Uh, this question right here. Thank you, Lois Balin of Sir Optimist International. You implied that perhaps working with the surrounding countries would be the focus of the solution. I'm wondering if you could expand on that because I know Turkey uh, clearly is very much involved with refugees right now. Uh, yeah, I must recognize that uh, Turkey is doing an extraordinary job uh, with the refugees, extremely generous. And I will ask Karin to characterize this. The camps of is are of a great uh, quality and uh, there are 100,000 uh, refugees uh, in in Turkey today, uh, as a whole, in all the the countries, there are around uh, registered no 350,000 uh, uh, refugees. Uh, but y you have in Jordan, uh, you have in Lebanon, uh, and you have even in Egypt. You have uh, and the Iraq. Uh, that is all. You have refugees, and the, the refugees are, are not only a humanitarian problems. Is also um, a factor of uh, bring uh, instability. Jordan, for instance, is, and, uh, and you have an extra problem that is the, the Palestinian refugees in Syria. Uh, the, uh, the government of Syria cooperated very much with uh, the presence of uh, help, uh, supported very much the presence of this. If, if Felicia allows me, I'll, I'll invite Karen to say something because she's mu much more competent than I about this question of the refugees and uh, uh, the the regions and uh <coughs> just a couple of points of you know in June there were about three hundred thousand registered refugees and now there's three hundred fifty thousand well there one hundred thousand in June and three hundred fifty thousand now and growing and those are just the ones that the UNHCR and others have been able to register so it's a growing problem and as Paolo said is quite serious in terms of regional stability particularly when the refugees associate with one group or another as they do both in Lebanon especially, but also in Jordan, and even in Turkey, of course. Uh, so you can see the, the difficulties that are created by those populations and the growing populations. The camps in Turkey were what we called five-star camps, the Turkish uh, government taking complete care, very good care, like refugee conditions I've never seen anywhere in 30 years of refugee work. But now the numbers are becoming too great for the Turks, so they're having to ask for help as well. 
So uh, this is a, a, a growing problem that uh, will have to be dealt with, and I think many people are thinking about the longer-term consequences of these populations sitting on the borders. Um, again, this is something in usual refugee work. You make sure the refugees are far away from the borders so there aren't the security problems. Now, that hasn't been possible. They just are there. So uh, we're all watching this rather carefully. Uh, and this is, as Paul has also mentioned, some of the uh, problems inside. There are 1.2 million internally displaced people inside Syria, plus the 2.5 million we think need humanitarian aid. And then the Palestinians and the Iraqis inside Syria are also no longer being cared for as they were so well by the Syrian government. And they're beginning to uh, exodus again, becoming refugees again. There are 6,000 of each group, Iraqis gone back to Iraq, and 6,000 Palestinians who have gone to both Jordan and Lebanon. So, Maggie, she wants to tell us. I had uh, um, intended uh, to actually give the first question to our Leo Nevis Human Rights Fellow for this year, Ryan Kaminsky, who's been so central in organizing the events uh, today and uh, who I'm happy to call on right now. Um, thank you very much for your comments thus far and for sharing your thoughts with us on this important topic. Uh, my question concerns, um, we learned this morning that when the Commission of Inquiry, the mandate for the Commission of Inquiry ends, you'll become the special rapporteur on the situation in Syria. And with the mandate extended during the 21st session of the Human Rights Council for six months, I'm wondering if, um, one, what, act, what things need to happen on the ground in order for the Commission of Inquiry to expire and for you to take over a special rapporteur. And secondly, if you're hopeful in six months, you'll have that new role um, rather than the um, Commission Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I try to to forget that I have already this mandate because uh, I don't know how. It, it would be much more difficult to operate as a, a special rapporteur. Uh, uh, that is, who does uh, uh, it is the Human Rights Council that decides um, the continuation of or the extinction of the uh, the commission. Uh, one of I think that one of the motivations of uh, the, ex the extension of our mandate, uh, I think that was uh, that the Human Rights Council considered that the commission was doing a good job in terms of uh, collecting uh, data, um, collecting evidence for future investigations and uh, uh, the Human Rights Council thought that was uh, not uh, a, a, a wise decision to interrupt uh, this, uh, this work, we, uh, precisely with the aggrava aggravation of the crisis. Uh, that is, um, a positive scenario will be that uh, that will have a, a, a ceasefire, no? Because this is essential to to, uh, that the situation on the ground be improved because uh, now it's uh, that is what Karen said that is it's not the crisis is not uh, Syria it's becoming a regional crisis and the presence of these refugees that, uh, that you try to add all these elements you have the refugees that goes that go to uh, all these countries you have the refugees that are very close of the frontier in, in many countries like uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, you have uh, refugees from, uh, from, the, uh, from different uh, uh, orientations and uh, the groups inside Lebanon that uh, support Assad or are against, uh, uh, against Assad. You have uh, the involvement of, um, of uh, me uh, different member states supporting uh, the government or supporting the, the armed groups. And then, uh, in French you say, la série dans, dans les gâteaux, uh, you have the jihadists. Uh, uh, today, uh, in some reports, there were, uh, I think Brahim was saying thousands of uh, jihadists. Uh, as he said this, I, I will say the same, uh, thousands. Uh, 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 that is, yesterday, uh, uh, this morning I was saying that it, it's not an invasion of an army of jihadists. It's, not, uh, it's good not to exaggerate. But as you see how, how complicated it will be uh, the solution of, uh, of this crisis. Uh, then I, I, I can't say if, uh, I hope that uh, our mandate will not be extended because uh, we cannot be commissioners forever. 
Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I think that is very important because there is no other group doing our work uh, inside the UN. And then uh, that is Human Rights Watch, Amnesty uh, International Crisis Group. They do ex excellent uh, reports, uh, but they don't have the same wave uh, of uh, an impartial uh, uh, commission uh, doing the job in the in the framework of the United Nations. But my answer is, uh, we I don't know what will happen. I try not to think uh, about that I am the special potency. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Broker, I'm with the Jacob Lassen Institute. Uh, really appreciate your comments today. My question is about the comment that you just made about how there's no other group doing the kind of work you're doing. Could you describe any observations you might have about the state of Syrian civil society after a conflict that's gone on this long? It seems to me that with the likelihood of the Security Council referring the situation to the International Criminal Court still being very low, the best hope or one of the remaining hopes for action being taken on the kind of materials that you've been gathering, the facts you've been gathering, is going to come from some sort of transitional group in Syria eventually. And my question is, do you see that people like that exist in the country? Do they are, they are they operating? Is anyone available that would be able to carry out the kind of transitional justice type work that would be necessary for accountability for the abuses you've been documenting? Thanks. Thank you. No, uh, I, one of, uh, that is one of our reports uh, in the recommendations, it was very clear that uh, this will be the role of the Syrians and the Syrian society. That is, we don't think that the international community has a recipe to solve all the, uh, these problems. I, at this moment, we are speaking about the International Criminal Court because we have a civil war, etc. But having uh, been in a dictator, a military dictatorship for 21 years, uh, when you, you are outside the country, you think that there is an empty, th that society does not exist. That is uh, uh, the same uh, concerns Burma, Myanmar, or Burundi, other countries where always there are people uh, fighting. Uh, they are inside the government. You, uh, in, in when I worked uh, in, in uh, Myanmar, you have honest uh, uh, judge uh, 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 prosecutors uh, doing their jobs. They wanted to do something serious. Some began to be concerned by uh, by human rights. Uh, then uh, the the Syrian. Uh, uh, the Syrian society was very sophisticated. When I prepare the World Report on Violence Against Children, uh, they were always my allies uh, against the fundamentalists uh, uh, in other countries. And uh, they were very secular. They were, uh, uh, for instance, supporting legislation against uh, corporal punishment, something that's very controversial in, uh, in many countries. Uh, and then uh, uh, they did, uh, as Karen was saying, a wonderful job uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, the Palestinian refugees and the Iraqi refugees. Uh, that is, I, I don't think that uh, when, uh, if uh, you have a uh, ceasefire and uh, you return to peace, uh, that I, uh, I think that I, I when I was there in June, I met with the traditional uh, opposition parties, uh, people that for decades they they have been in prison and they continue opposing. Doesn't mean they are fake opposition. They are real people uh, uh, fighting for the, the rule of law. And uh, uh, the fact that they are inside Syria doesn't mean that they are favorable to the government. Then I think that you will have good surprises that uh, you have sectors inside. The, uh, for instance, these uh, local coordinating group committees. Uh, uh, that are inside, that they are very respectful, respectful people that are working uh, with a lot of risks inside Syria. Now, I, I think that uh, uh, Syria uh, will be able also to deal uh, with uh, a transitional, um, uh, political transitional and transitional uh, justice. Uh, and it's something that uh, we highlight uh, in many of our reports. That it's not just to wait the international community to, to, uh, to come and to solve all, all these problems. I, I think that uh, the, f uh, the future uh, situation in, in Syria will open some possibilities also.
Uh, my name is Salwa Kader. I'm with the U.S. Federation for Middle East Peace. And I had the pleasure of meeting you a little bit earlier as we have worked with Ms. Uh, Karen Zia, and we have utmost respect for her and her work, and of course for you also. My question is about um, the refugees. Um, we have tried to send uh, certain uh, monetary aid through UNHCR a few months ago, we sent a, a good amount of money, and now we are launching another um, drive to send money and blankets uh, for the refugees. Hopefully we'll be able to send them to the ones in Lebanon and Jordan and to the Palestinians inside Syria. Uh, my question to you, uh, I'm sure, yes, to, to Karen, is about um, the plight of the refugees from the P Palestinian refugees because they are not considered under the status, the international status of refugees. So from what I just recently read, that they only allow them for two weeks or something like that under the refugee status, and then they have a whole other complicated problem. While the other refugees, um, given is it in Jordan, Lebanon, um, they're still refugees, but they have more privilege uh, under the refugee international law rather than the Palestinian. How accurate is this, and what can we do about it? There's always been a particular problem about Palestinians in Jordan. You know, the 48 refu Palestine refugees in Jordan are citizens of Jordan. The 67 Palestine refugees who went into Jordan are still second-class citizens. They don't, they're not citizens of Jordan. They're in special camps. They're known as the Gazan refugees or the Jurash refugees and so on. And they have more problems in getting support and so on. They're almost entirely dependent on UNRWA, not on the Jordanian government or the others are. So that's, that's part of the problem. So when the now the, the too many Palestinians began to come into Jordan, when they were the first 1,000, they were well taken care of in places on the border. But now there's a re resistance to having them come in. Uh, it's the same happening in Turkey where people are, certain people are being held on the border of certain, you know, certain backgrounds, uh, including particularly the Palestinian. Uh, in uh, Lebanon, all of them are having problems. So um, it's that's true about Jordan only. Uh, the Palestinians are refugees, of course, and they're internationally recognized as refugees, and they are being refugees for a second and third time now. That's what's happening, and they're in a bad shape in, in Jordan particularly. We have time for about one more question. I don't see a hand. Ah, very good. Yes, your hand was up before. Sir. Yes. Thank you for your, your presentation and your work and, and your honesty also in mentioning that it's a, a partly a religious Alawite Sunni Shiite issue and also bring up that it's a civil war. In the civil wars, isn't there always a, a justice element? And also for honesty in bringing up that it's uh, not just a human rights problem, but it's a Security Council problem. And there's an article also in Current History uh, of October 2012 uh, talking about Russia's role and uh, why Moscow fears Arab unrest and basically the need for stability and change. And don't we need to ask what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, and need to revision uh, the UN, the uh, forces of creative destruction and a, a recommitment and UN renewal is something I think Felicia and I can work on and not being scared of the religious issues of bringing people together and the importance of human rights and the issue of modernity, but not rejecting a sense of God or our spiritual emotional realities, but working together for a better world in this one. Um, and, and the question is, shouldn't it be looked at more broadly? crisis be looked at more broadly because of the, uh, the, 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 the Yeah. 
Ja, ja se uh, Archbishop uh, uh, Tutu said a wonderful thing in the in the uh, in the dinner for the other um, honorists. Uh, it, uh, there wa it was a question about politics and religion, and, and he said the problem, uh, 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 the problems are not in the religions, but the problem are in the faithful. That is the the people invoking uh, their religion for this uh, uh, this, this war, and uh, he elaborated on that. Uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, there were several uh, there are several initiatives uh, inside the UN, for instance the. Uh, the dialogue uh, um, amongst uh, civilizations. Uh, uh, Kofi Annan had uh, uh, some initiative, also specific, uh, uh, some uh, reflection on on, uh, on religions. Yes, I I I, I, I think that uh, uh, the crisis in Syria could be a good pretext for a conversation uh, on that. O of course, this is very much uh, um, beyond uh, our uh, our. Mandate, uh, but uh, we are um, we are we are very much impacted by how uh, this uh, fight uh, against uh, against the government has uh, 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 has become uh, um, under the under the influence of the the different uh, uh, religious uh, creeds uh, and. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that this is uh, more revealed by the presence of the, those uh, uh, r uh, sort of religious combatants uh, from abroad that are they are uh, fighting for their own agendas, uh, because in the in the beginning uh, of the conflict this was not very clear, uh, because as we uh, mentioned in the report, because of the sectarian uh, escalation of the conflict. Uh, the uh, religion, because he, uh, Syria was, uh, uh, in fact, a secular state. People were not uh, every time showing their religious card. Uh, if they are Sunni or they are Shia or they are Druze, this didn't work like that. I, even because, also because the Alawites, um, a sort of loose uh, uh, religious people, they are not so uh, uh, militant in terms of. Uh, uh Practicing their their religion, and, and this also irritates a lot uh, other other groups, and the uh, mostly the Shia that consider them as uh, heretics. No, this is uh, not only that is you uh, you are perfect right because this also address the situation uh, in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and all these new democracies emerging uh, in the in the Middle East. Yeah. I remember about a dozen years ago, Kofi Annan was asked about uh, some of these issues uh, uh, plaguing the world uh, from from uh, extremists, and he said, it's not the faith, it's the faithful. And that sounds to me like you heard the, uh, another version of it um, uh, as well. The, uh, the uh, Independent Commission has a mandate to investigate all alleged violations of international human rights law since March 2011 in the Syrian Arab Republic and to establish the facts and circumstances that may amount to such violations and the crimes perpetrated and identify those responsible. It doesn't have a mandate for more than that. It's doing that mandate. I think we heard today uh, both from the chairman and commissioner uh, just how much it has done how much uh, and how well it has done this. And I personally wanted to thank you both for your service and for this important work. And we look forward to uh, hearing uh, when all is uh, uh, resolved uh, and uh, human rights are being uh, respected or restored in this situation. We look forward to hearing from you your assessment of, of, uh, of how this all went. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Felice and, and Paolo and Karen, uh, and for everybody who attended. As I say, um, please take copies of the report on the way out if you'd like one. Thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.